Please welcome to the stage, wherever Billy might be. You look like he's over here. I'm over here. Hey, good night. Yeah, well, I'm just gonna do the whole thing from over here. So. That's me with uh, far less beard five years ago. My wife made fun of me for that, that picture uh, and said that I needed to get a new headshot. And I said, no, I like hanging out by lakes. So that's, that's me. So uh, like Dave said, I'm Billy. I'm going to stand on the carpet because it feels fun. Um, my name is Billy. I am a director for Denver Botanic Films here. Uh, Denver Botanic Films, as Hannah sort of mentioned, is our own uh, sort of film company and our own attempt to create engaging documentaries here at the Garlands. Um, before I go any further, I just want to say how honored I am to be able to speak in front of all of you. This is actually only my second uh, creative morning that I've ever been to. The first was a couple months ago uh, at the Cooper Parker Robinson Dance Center. And it was one of those amazing experiences where I, I walked into the room and I, I've never really been a fan of, of networking groups because it's always just like, Hi, nice to meet you. I am a this person. I am a this person. Here is my business card. But this group could not be any more different. It was one of those awesome experiences where you just walk into the room and you're like, yeah, this is, this is my people. So this is my second creative mornings, but it will not be my last. Now, how many of you have actually been to the gardens before? Go ahead and raise your hand. Quite a few of you. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's, that's more than I expected. Well, how many of you have, this is your first time here? Great. Well, welcome. All right. Now for the other more important question, we can't go any farther. How many of you act, can actually say that you care about plants? All right. Now the more daring question, how many of you can say that you don't care about plants? There's, there's a couple. There's a, there's a couple. That's totally fine. Is there any more? I'm going to, one last chance. Anybody else not care about plants? All right. I'm going to go ahead and raise my hand. I care about plants now. However, before I started here, I can honestly say I didn't care, which is an odd thing because now it's sort of my, my bread and butter. Uh, as a uh, filmmaker here at the gardens, I'm charged with uh, telling stories about plants. And I got to tell you, there is an abundance of them. All right. Abundance. All right. Abundance. Um, so, plants are somewhat of a difficult thing, you might think, to tell a story about. So, this is a tree. This is a tree, yeah. So, this tree has an amazing story. Does anybody want to guess what that story is? And before, before anybody takes a guess, I wanted somebody to take a wild stab at it. I will tell you, this is an American sycamore. And to, for clarification, we are talking about this tree. That took me so long to animate that. I can animate and edit videos all day long, but when it comes to PowerPoint, I was like, this is a whole new world and I don't know how to do it. But I did it. I put a thing up there. Um, so this is an American sycamore. Now, I want somebody to raise their hand and tell me what you think the story of this tree might be. Anybody? What do you think the story is? Uh, actually, no. This one didn't start. As, you're close. That is, that is the story for a lot of plants. Now, plants have uh, this, this interesting thing. They could be, just like you said, they could be a parent plant drops a seed, that seed germinates, it sprouts, it grows a plant. That's a pretty good story. It's amazing that it just germinates in the ground, nothing but sunlight, water, and maybe a little bit of hope and love in there, and it, and it sprouts into a plant. This tree has an incredible story, and I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. First, I have to do that thing uh, and, and tell you a little bit about my background and how I got interested in plants. So, um, as Dave mentioned, before being a documentary filmmaker, um, I was not into film. I was not into plants. I was not into any of that. Hello? It cut out. Hello? Cool. Um, so I wasn't into any of that. At a very young age, I was about six or seven, my parents took me to see a show called Riverdance um, yeah, at, the, at the Buell Theater here in Denver. And from that moment, it was like the first time that I walked into Creative Mornings. I was like, this is what I want to do. And that's what I did. So I spent the next however many years uh, competing and uh, performing 
all around the state and competing all the way up to the world championships, um, which happened all over. Um, but always with that goal in my mind that eventually someday I wanted to tour with Riverdance. And so I graduated high school and I thought, great, now I'm going to just give it a shot. It's a long shot to get into Riverdance, but I auditioned and luckily I got in. It was incredible. Um, thank you. I, it's, old, it's old news now, and now I'm just an old guy with broken knees and, and can't do much. Um, anyway, so I traveled with them for about three years. I traveled with them for a total of five years, but after three years, I sort of had this realization that I was looking at all of my friends, and a lot of them were getting to be 31, 32, 33, which is not old, I realize now, because that's how old I am now. But at the time, I was 18, I was like, these people were oldest, old fogies. But what I realized is that they had all done what I did. They focused their entire life on getting into Riverdance, and all they had to show for it was, sure, a very full passport with all those camps in there. We got to travel around the world. It was incredible. But they didn't really have anything that they could do once they stopped dancing. So I decided I'm going to go back to school. And so I did. I went back to school, and I took... Um, I was in business classes. I was in, I took some acting classes. I was in environmental science. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but the issue wasn't I couldn't find anything that I didn't want to, I couldn't find anything that I wanted to do. It's that I couldn't find anything that I didn't want to do. It was a real, a real issue. I just, just jumping around like, ooh, I could do this, I could do that. But then eventually I finally said, okay, let's stick with this film thing for a little bit. And so I did. I stuck with the film thing for about two years. And then I remember very clearly um, I was sitting doing homework for one of the things that I did not like, which is math. I don't, I don't understand how any of you can do math. It's, uh, I was doing math homework, and I got a call from my friend. And he said, this is a friend from my Riverdance days, and he said, hey, I created a show. Um, it got booked for a national tour. Do you want to come do it with me? And I said, uh, math homework or travel the country with my friends. Yeah, I'm going to do the second one. I'm going to do the second one for sure. So what I did is I, I convinced them. I said, I, I'm not going to go with you unless you allow me to uh, film a behind-the-scenes documentary series about, uh, about the show. And so he let me do that. This is the show. It's called Rock and Road to Dublin. That's, that's me over there hiding in the shadows. Um, this is the best picture that I could find of it. But um, So he let me film behind the scenes documentary. I was doing two things, my, my new found love of film, which I actually really started to like, and dance, and I got to combine them together. And what it made me realize is that not only did I like film, but I really liked documentary film specifically. Films, hello? <laughs> uh, films are, narrative films are one of those things you get to make up a character and you get to tell any story in the world, but to me, the more interesting thing is to tell the real story of real people. Interview real people and tell their stories. So, I was, I, was, I was sitting pretty, but all good things come to an end. I got to make film and dance at the same time. It was great. Like I said, all, all good things come to an end, and I had to go back and finish school. And I did that, but what I kept in mind is that documentary filmmaking is really, really what I wanted to do. And so, after... After I graduated, I kept doing uh, documentaries. And one of the documentaries, it was actually a reality show that I got contacted to do for the first time that I went up to Alaska. Um, it, it was a show called Building Alaska. It's one of those shows that's like, yeah, it's not great, but it was super fun to make. Um, we got to go up to Alaska, and we were flying around in bush planes and, and going to the most exotic places all over Alaska. And I was really having fun despite all of these um, little mosquitoes and things like that trying to bite you at all times up there. But then what I realized in Alaska, this was the next big realization in my life, is that documentaries are great, but what's even better is nature documentaries, because nature tells an abundance of stories. So when I came back from this, I, you know, I did some other documentaries, and then I got a job here at the gardens. And did I care about plants yet? No, I sure didn't. <laughs> it took me. It took me a little while, um, and and it was and I, I still was sort of floundering a little bit. But uh, I started to realize more and more that plants are are 
a really, really cool thing. So when I started working here, one of the first projects that I got to work on, um, Scott also got to work on I saw him uh, around here. There he is, he's at the back. Uh, Scott and I both got to do uh, images for the big nature immersion wall out there. Um, did anybody see that out there? Kind of big, hard to miss. Uh, it's called the Jonathan Mirage Nature Immersion Wall. Um, we, if we were given a grant when we were building this building to uh, create the Nature Immersion Wall. And with that grant, we were given the money to buy all of the equipment that we, could, that we would ever need to create content for the wall, which was fantastic. Um, so about a, about a year or so went by, I was getting to go to all of these beautiful places around Colorado filming some of the most beautiful things that you, you'd ever seen. Sounds like a rough gig, right? I go camping, bring a camera with, yeah, it's terrible. Um, no, it, it's really, it's really a, an incredible project to work on. This wall is 40 feet wide and 12 feet tall, so it's a very interesting form factor. Anybody in here uh, camera people? Yeah, quite, quite a few. So it's, it's, an, it's an interesting shape, and what I, I love working on things that you uh, like have an interesting form factor in the, uh, in the export. Nerdy stuff. I'll, I'll continue with the non-nerdy stuff. Nerds are great, by the way. This world would not go around without nerds. Uh, and I might mention a, a few more nerds, but I, when I say nerds, I, I mean it with the most loving sense of the word. Um, anyways, after about a year of doing this, um, our CEO, Brian Vogt, uh, came to me and said, we have all of this equipment. We have this auditorium where what we do is we show other people's documentaries. We show nature-focused documentaries in here twice a day to everybody that comes into the gardens. Um, it's free, no extra charge on top of uh, your admissions. But what he said is, can we make our own documentaries? And what I said is, sure, give it a crack. Yeah, let's, let's, let's try and do it. Um, so I was tasked with coming up with ideas for uh, films, telling plant stories. Great. Um, what the issue that I ran into is I started talking to all of these so-called nerds, these wonderful, wonderful nerds who know so much about plants and are so passionate about plants. And I, kept, I was given dozens and dozens of ideas for stories. So it was more difficult. There was so much abundance that I had to narrow down what I wanted to do. So the first film that we made actually was brought to me by a guy named Anthony. He's unfortunately no longer with the gardens because he had to go do some master's program in, in Italy uh, on agriculture in Bologna. Sounds, sounds terrible again, right? Um, he came to me and he had this idea that really just stood out to me. He had met somebody uh, named Dr. Bonnie Clark. She is an archaeologist, and she works at DU. And what she does is every summer, she takes a group of students down to Amachi. Does anybody know what Amachi is? Great. So Amachi, let's, let's hopefully more people raise their hand for this one. Does anybody know what happened with Japanese internment? And great. Okay. So during World War II, um, Japanese American people were moved from the West Coast forcibly uh, to internment camps. They were seen as the enemy and they were seen as a risk just because of the color of their skin. Now, I had heard about this in school. I had, I, you know, I grew up here in Denver. I went to public schools and I went to that one history class uh, that they had that awkward, yeah, we sort of did this one thing this one time. And they didn't really mention it. It was sort of swept under the rug even then. But what they didn't do is they didn't mention that Amachi is a Japanese internment camp that's here in our state. Has anybody, anybody heard of that? That there's, yeah, there's a Japanese internment camp in our state. I didn't know about it until Anthony was talking to me about it, which is extremely sad. And I, 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 as soon as I heard that, I thought, yeah, we've got to do something about this. So without really knowing much more than that, we went down to Amachi with Dr. Clark. And me still not knowing much about plants, um, I didn't understand why she was so excited to show us this plant. This plant is a rose, um, and it's growing next to one of the, uh, the foundations for one of the barracks. Now, I didn't really realize why this rose, why this rose was such a big deal. 
Ooh, it's breaking up. Um, why this rose was such a big deal. I sort of went to Anthony and said, why are you, why are you so excited about this rose? And he said, well, roses don't really exist naturally in this area. And I said, what do you mean? What? And Dr. Clark chimed in and said, this rose, that means that somebody had to have planted it. So this rose, the only way that it would have gotten there, the only people that had lived on site that had planted anything, was the Japanese incarcerated 80 years ago. So these roses have been living, like I said, up against, you can see the cement uh, frame here, or the cement uh, foundation, that's the word, thank you. Uh, the cement foundation, and the roses were able to survive next to it because it, the foundation sort of cooled water and it drains right to where those uh, roses are living. Roses, they take a little bit of um, love and care to, to stay alive and even more love and care to get to bloom. So we decided that could be the film. We could see if we could get these roses to bloom again. Now, I'm not going to spoil anything for you because, like we said, uh, if anybody wants to stay afterwards, we're going to be showing this film uh, at 10.30. Um, I hope most of you can stay. If not, we're doing the public premiere. is in, is going to be in January. Um, this is a poster for it. Quite exciting to have to have that. It's been accepted into a couple different film festivals, which is great. Um, but like I said, it's going to be shown in here uh, to the public for free, and I, I hope that you guys can make it. Now, again, there's an abundance of stories. All good things come to an end. This project is done. What's the next story, right? Remember this, this tree? All right, so this tree, I promised you, had a story that is it, it's pretty cool. It's out of this world cool. Um, before I tell you the story, though, I'm going to tell you the premise of the next film. The next film is uh, it's about the human connection with trees. So what I want you to do, if you feel comfortable in a room full of people, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to think of your favorite tree. Now, I don't mean your favorite type of tree or your favorite uh, species of tree. What I mean is maybe that tree that you used to climb as a kid or read books under. Or for me, it was a tree in my grandma's front yard that we used to ride those big wheels under. And I can still picture that tree and avoiding the sharp needles of the spruce tree. Now, open your eyes. And is anybody here willing to share their little snippet, what, what their favorite tree is? Go ahead. Yeah. That's that's awesome. You'd be surprised how many people's favorite tree is something from from their childhood. Now, my my theory with this, and if if you didn't think of any tree right away, I want you to keep thinking about it throughout the day. I've gotten. I've had this conversation with a lot of people, and I get texts like two, three hours later saying, I thought of it after they had adamantly said, uh, I, I don't have a favorite tree. But keep thinking about it, and I bet you at some point something will come to the forefront of your mind. Um, I, was, I was just having this conversation with somebody in uh, Jamaica last week. I was on vacation, and she was saying that her favorite tree, she immediately was like, yeah, I have a favorite tree. Um, and it was a, a tree that grows this special uh, aki, which is a Jamaican uh, national dish. And she said that she used to sit on her dad's shoulders to pick the aki. And so it's not so much the story of the tree, it's the story of the memory. And that's what this film is about, is that type of thing. So what I've done is I've found four different stories, four different interesting stories about trees, uh, special trees. So the first story is about Pando, which is a giant aspen clone. It's the largest living organism on the planet by weight, and it lives in uh, Utah. It's an aspen clone. The second story is a gentleman in Fort Collins who he tracked down the last confirmed living tree of Johnny Appleseed, and he now is growing it in his backyard. The third is a really interesting story that is a bonsai tree. It's called the Yamaki Pine. It lives at the National Arboretum, very near where this tree lives. 
Um, and it is a almost 400-year-old bonsai tree. It's been in training for 400 years. Before that, uh, it, it must have lived for uh, a, a few years beyond that. So in training means it's been in the pot, being taken care of for 400 years. And beyond that, it also survived the bombing at Hiroshima. And then it was donated to the United States as sort of a feast offering. Now this tree, as I said, has... Oh, I didn't get the arrow! Oh, no! Oh, well. Um, this tree, like I said, has a story that is out of this world. This is what's known as a moon tree. Has anybody heard of moon trees before? One person. Great, I'm telling an interesting story that nobody's heard of. Um, so moon trees come from the Apollo 14 mission. So this guy right here, his name is Stu Lusa, Colonel Stu Lusa. He's actually from Durango, Colorado, born and raised there. Um, he then moved when he was like 10, but we'll, we'll still keep that claim to fame. He's from Colorado, and he was the command module pilot for Apollo 14. And he brought with him, because he used to work for the, before the, uh, he was an astronaut, he worked uh, in the U.S. Forest Service. And so he was passionate about forests and trees. And he brought with him a jar full of tree seeds. And this is one of the first uh, horticultural experiments that uh, took place in space. And he brought the tree seeds with him. And he came back, and they didn't know if the trees would germinate due to being in space or anything. They didn't really know much then. Of, of course, it ended up working. And they were able to sprout around 200 trees from these seeds. And they planted them all around the country and all around the world, really, at important buildings, state capitals, uh, the White House, they had some in Brazil, Japan, all over the place. What they didn't do is they didn't put any signs on any of the trees because they were honestly worried that these trees would be stolen. You know, they planted them when they were only about this tall, so digging them up and taking them would not have been too difficult. So the trees were sort of lost to time. So this film, uh, on top of those other three stories, talks about, uh, her, her name is Rosemary Rusa, it's uh, Stu Rusa's daughter, and she is actually cultivating a second generation of clippings. And that's why I say this one didn't come from seeds, it was actually a grafted tree, meaning it was, you basically cut a little piece of a branch and you graft it to rootstock uh, of another tree, and it grows, and it basically makes an old tree new. And it grows genetically identical copies to this tree. So that is the fourth story. Um, Dave, how am I doing on time? I should have about five minutes left. Cool, good. All right, then I can, then I can continue. Um, so what I want you all to take from this today is two things. First, as you walk down the streets of Denver, or really any city, or out here in our gardens, which I hope you take advantage of going and walking around, even though it's cold. Every plant that you see has some sort of story. Now, it may not, not be something like going to the moon, but every plant that you see was planted by somebody. And those plants may, may just be something that's been in cultivation like a daisy for hundreds of years. Or it could be a more water-smart plant that some horticulturist or botanist has been working on for decades to try and be a more water-smart, uh, eco-friendly plant, and they do that through crossbreeding generation after generation, creating super plants, uh, plants that, that we would want to see. So I want you to think about that. Don't just, don't just walk by plants anymore. They all have a story. Somebody's been, been working on that. Now, the second thing that I want you to take from this is we're all, we're all creative people, right? That's why we're here, creative mornings. So, I want you to take from this that nature and plants can be a source of inspiration for your creative endeavors. Whether or not you're working on your uh, working on something about plants, or you could be writing a song, or you could be uh, doing graphic design for uh, uh, anything, uh, a, a weasel fern, or something. Um, nature and plants can help you accomplish your creative goals. Now, I say this because I was trying to come up with ideas for this uh, presentation, and so I did what I should have done uh, a while ago, and I, I stopped just like staring at my computer screen, and I got out 
and I started just taking random pictures around the gardens, and that sort of made me focus and to walking through the gardens, walking through nature, walking through anything. It sort of calms your mind. And this is something that I've noticed that it takes all of the things that you're that are distracting you, and it makes them go away, and it makes you focus on the little things. It's it's really it's an it's an amazing thing, and the only way I can't really explain it to you. So I want you to go experience it yourself. Next time you feel like you're stuck in your creative endeavors, I want you to go outside at the very least. Walk out your door, take a breath of fresh air, and feel feel that calming uh, uh, just hitting your soul. So that is all I have for today. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything? It could be about anything that I that I talked about. Any questions? Anything like that? I have one. Did you read this on your side and then tell everyone that they can find it more time? Left to right, top to bottom, group words together to make sentences. Yeah. Okay. Like cool. Okay. Get creative in 2023. Use discount code S. Use the discount code, yeah, SBI, a new year, uh, for $10 off any course, lecture, or workshop. That is 215.23. QR code. Can anybody scan it? <laughs> um, all right. Any other questions or anything like that? Or anybody? Oh. We have a school of mechanical art and illustration. This is a coupon for our new classes, which range in everything from creative meditation to illustration, painting, caustic, um, print making, really the full gamut. So please grab one on your way out, check it out, and come hang out with us. That's why, uh, again, that, that's, she knows a lot about that. Yeah, you raise your hand there at the back first. I can't. I can't. No, the, the, the old the old knees won't 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 allow it. Uh, it's on YouTube. Billy Keneally. You can you can you can look it up. It does. Yeah. I I my friends and I we actually have a pact. We know we're all going to have to have knees or ankle replaced at some point. We said we're all going to hold off and do our knee replacement surgeries or ankle replacement surgeries at the same time, and then we're all going to go in our wheelchairs to Vegas together. Yeah. I have a question. What's the thread that you're thinking about when you said that you're thinking about? And I would like to kind of know what you're thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. So I like to think that I might be a little bit of a selfish documentarian filmmaker because I use every way. And I was talking to Rachel about this just before. Uh, the, the presentation, how documentary filmmaking, people say that the best way to learn about something is to teach about it. I think the best way to learn about something is to make a documentary about it. And so while I say I don't know much about plants, I know a heck of a lot of about plants that I make films about. And so no, I, I know a lot about very few amount of plants. And so I don't know if I'm answering your question really, but yeah, documentary filmmaking, it, it, it's a especially nature-focused documentary, because that's really what I found my interest in, is nature. Uh, it really sort of connects me more. Now I can I can walk through the woods and I realize, oh, that's that's a rose plant. That's a, a, a this or that. So it really does, it kind of focuses me on on, on the new things that I, I learn about. Any other questions or anything? Yeah. My favorite plant... So far, um, I have really come to like apple trees. Um, working with Scott Stogerbo in in Fort Collins, I want to go to his backyard just like every single day. He's got one acre of uh, of an orchard, but he's got almost 270 different varieties of apples on that one acre. I didn't realize this about apples. But you can take a branch of an apple tree and graft it onto another apple tree, and that branch will retain the genetic material and grow the same apple from the tree that it came from. Meaning that you can have an apple tree that grows 
however many varieties of apple that you graft onto it. I think the record he said is something like 123 or four different apples, and that's on some tree in um, England, I think it is. And so I've, I've been very, very interested in, in apples. And something I didn't realize about apples is one of those things that you see the Granny Smith apples at the store or the uh, Fuji apples or anything like that. Those apples are all actually genetically identical, um, which is, is great in one way because they all taste the same, but it's also terrible because if a fungus comes that affects only Fuji apples, then it's, they're, they're all but gone almost instantly. Um, but it takes... It takes a, more than a decade to get an apple to market because once you find an apple that you like, you have to start grafting those trees. It takes 10, 15 years for those trees to really be commercially viable, growing enough apples. So when you see the, the, the cosmic, uh, cosmic crisp, yeah, that apple I know that took them like 30 years to actually, from, from start to finish, to start getting those to market. And you'll probably start seeing them more. That's why apples like the Red Delicious, which are not delicious, they're terrible, they're not going anywhere. They spend so much time creating those apples, they're, they're not going anywhere. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so documentaries, I like, I like telling real stories. I mean, you can come up with a story about Let's come up with one right now. A, a ferret that goes to the mall to find uh, gifts for his uh, turtle uh, husband. And you can come up with any story. You, see what I'm you, can, you can come up with any story. And, and, but what I like to do is find people who have interesting stories. And I think that's why my, now my favorite uh, plant is apple trees, because I found um, Scott uh, in Fort Collins, and he's just this the most passionate person I've ever seen about apples, which obviously there's not that many people that are passionate about apples, but his passion sort of drives me now to want to look into the apples more. So I guess that's what it is. is it's, it's the real stories, the, the real um, connections. And it's, it's, it's far more interesting and compelling to me. Now I can see why some people might not. Like, I, I love watching Marvel movies and, and all those. So that's, that's a great escape, but documentaries are are really, really interesting. Uh, in this role, I've, I've been finding people, hopefully someday people will come knocking and say, I have a film idea, and I'll be like, great, let's look me. <laughs> yeah. I have never spoken to Ken Burns. <laughs> uh, Ken, Ken Burns films are, are really good, I, I mean, He's, in the editing world, there is something known as the Ken Burns effect, where you basically take a picture and you kind of move it and you animate the pictures. And I've, I use that in, in Amashi Rose. He's one of the people that uh, is so influential in the documentary world that he has a style named after him, which is, is really cool. I, I doubt someday that there's going to be a, the Billy Kennedy effect. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. I don't know what that would be. Maybe I'll, I'll, come, up, I'll come up with something. But... A favorite tree in my memory, yeah. So my favorite tree uh, is, is actually, there, there are two of them. One of them is the, my, the tree in my grandmother's front yard that we used to, do you know what a big wheel is? Those, those little plastic things that you crash and scrape your knees on, and they're great fun, but I don't know if I would ever be able to put my kids on them because they'd be broken. Um, I don't have kids yet, but eventually. Um, we used to ride trees around it, and it was sort of at the bottom of a hill, and you used to have to jump off before you hit the tree. Yeah, yeah. And then the second one is a, is a stand of Aspen cone that my brothers and I used to uh, go play hide and seek in. It was a, it was a great, great memory. Usually people's favorite trees come from childhood memories, I think. So, any one, maybe one more question? All right, send it back over to Dave. Big round of applause for Billy. Billy, we have a little gift for you. Thank you for your, your time, your contribution, and your story.